All right, in the evidence gathering stage of an audit, the exam will ask you, when does the auditor perform substantive analytical procedures? Well, let's start by saying that most audit procedures are designed toward one particular assertion for one specific account. For example, in the inventory cycle, if we wanted to test existence of inventory, the auditor would move from the client's inventory report to the count tags to support the existence assertion. That will be a test of details. Testing from the inventory report, the detailed inventory listing, to the count tags to make sure that everything on the inventory report was actually counted. And that test of details would support the existence assertion to make sure that all inventory that's on the detailed report actually exists. So that's an example of a test of details. Analytical procedures, they can be broader in scope. Instead of just testing one specific assertion for one account, in the same inventory cycle, the auditor might question if all the client's inventory listed in the report would even fit in the client's warehouse given the limited square footage of the client's warehouse. And that question would be more about the relationship between how big the client's warehouse is and how much inventory the client says they're holding. Therefore, analytical procedures are about the study of plausible relationships among financial data, such as the client's total inventory, and non-financial data, such as square footage of the warehouse. So what do we mean by plausible relationships? Well, an auditor believes that plausible relationships among data are reasonably expected to exist and continue in the absence of known conditions to the contrary. This assumption allows auditors to use analytical procedures to predict what the financial statements should show. And if the actual figures significantly deviate from these auditor expectations without a satisfactory explanation, it may indicate a potential misstatement. So auditors try to identify predictable relationships when applying analytical procedures. And income statement accounts tend to be more predictable than balance sheet accounts. Unless there's a good reason to think otherwise, the income statement is expected to follow a known pattern that the auditor develops from ratios and trends such as cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales or payroll tax expense as a percentage of payroll. Management has little or no discretion over payroll tax as a percentage of payroll. It should be about 12%. Cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales, that might be about 30%. In some industries, it might be 35%, but it shouldn't be 10% or 80% if it never was before. And these accounts would likely be chosen for analytical procedures because they have a plausible relationship that's expected to exist and continue in the absence of known conditions to the contrary. You might recall that early in the audit, analytical procedures must be used as a risk assessment procedure for planning the audit. Understand the client's business, significant transactions and events since the last audit. We use analytical procedures, have to use them in the planning stage of an audit. It's a must. Also, analytical procedures must be used in the overall review stage of an audit to make sure nothing obvious was missed in gap presentation. So two times where analytical procedures must be used, planning and the overall review stage of the audit. But analytical procedures may be used as a substantive procedure in the evidence gathering stage of the audit. It's optional. It's up to auditor's professional judgment. So when are analytical procedures required in the audit process? A says only at the planning stage, no. B, only at the final review stage, no. C, at both the planning and final review stages, yes. D, at the planning stage, as a substantive test, and in the final review stages, no. C is correct because the question wants to know when analytical procedures are required. When must analytical procedures be used? The planning and final review stages. So C is correct. Analytical procedures are required at both the planning stage and final review stage of the audit. During planning, they help the auditor understand the entity's business and identify potential areas of risk. At the final review stage, they're used to assess the overall reasonableness of the financial statements and to ensure that the audit findings are consistent and make sense in the context of the auditor's understanding of the business. So why was D wrong? Because the use of analytical procedures as substantive tests, we said is at the auditor's discretion, depends on the audit strategy rather than being a mandatory requirement at all times. So letter C is correct. How about this one? Which of the following is not a typical time for performing analytical procedures during an audit? So this one's not asking you when analytical procedures are required, 
but just when is it not a typical time for performing them? A says as part of risk assessment, no, that's mandatory. B in the substantive testing phase, well, that's optional. So it would be a typical time, even though it's not mandatory. C during the final review stage, that's mandatory. D during the evaluation of the entity's internal control system. Yeah, that's where it wouldn't be typical for performing analytical procedures. So let's go with D. Analytical procedures are typically used during the risk assessment phase, in the substantive testing phase, and during the final review stage. They're not typically used as a primary method for evaluating an entity's internal control system. The evaluation of internal controls usually involves specific test of controls, not analytical procedures. How about this? Auditors try to identify predictable relationships when applying analytical procedures. Relationships involving transactions from which of the following accounts most likely would yield the highest level of evidence. A, accounts receivable. B, interest expense. C, allowance for doubtful accounts. D, accounts payable. Well, the question's asking about the auditor trying to identify predictable relationships. And we said relationships are more predictable among income statement accounts than balance sheet accounts. Letter A, accounts receivable is a balance sheet account. So is C, allowance for doubtful accounts. That's a contra asset. D, accounts payable, balance sheet account. But letter B, interest expense, that's an income statement account. So letter B is correct. Income statement accounts tend to be more predictable than balance sheet accounts, and therefore interest expense would likely be chosen for analytical procedures since management has little or no discretion over interest expense. Therefore, interest expense would likely yield a higher level of evidence than these balance sheet accounts would. C is wrong. Allowance for doubtful accounts is affected by write-offs of specific receivables, which is not particularly predictable. And A is wrong. Accounts receivables affected by payments received from customers. Again, not predictable. And D is wrong. Accounts payables affected by payments made at the discretion of the audit client. Not predictable. So for substantive analytical procedures, first, the auditor must develop an expectation. That's step one. The auditor must establish a benchmark or an expectation based on historical data, industry averages, or other relevant sources. Then, auditors compare the actual figures on the financial statements with their expectations. Significant deviations are investigated further. And then, analytical procedures are often used in conjunction with other substantive tests. For instance, if an analytical procedure reveals an anomaly in inventory levels, the auditor might perform physical inventory counts to further investigate. All right, analytical procedures used as substantive tests typically involve what? A, physical inspection of assets. B, examination of ratios and trends in financial data. C, verifying the authenticity of signatures. D, all of these. So the answer is B, analytical procedures used as substantive tests typically involve examination of ratios and trends in financial data. Auditors use these procedures to compare financial data against expected patterns based on historical data industry averages, or other relevant benchmarks to identify any unusual or unexpected fluctuations that may indicate misstatements. A is wrong. Physical inspection is a test of details, not an analytical procedure. Analytical procedures involve analysis of data rather than physical examination of assets. And C is wrong. Verifying the authenticity of signatures, that's a form of test of details also, focusing on specific documentation and authorization not on the analysis of financial data, trends, or patterns. So letter B is correct. How about this? An example of using analytical procedures as a substantive test is A, reconciling bank statements, B, observing the counting of inventory, C, comparing the gross profit margin to industry averages, D, confirming accounts receivable balances with customers. And the answer is C, comparing the gross profit margin to industry averages is an example of using analytical procedures as a substantive test. This involves analyzing the financial data to see if the company's gross profit margin aligns with industry norms, which can help identify unusual variations that may need further investigation. A is wrong. Reconciling bank statements is a test of details, not an analytical procedure. That would involve matching the company's records to the bank's records to verify the accuracy of the cash transactions recorded. B is wrong. Observing the counting of inventory that would be a test of details that involves physically verifying the existence and the condition of inventory rather than analyzing financial data trends. And D is wrong, confirming accounts receivable balances with customers. That is also a test of details. It involves direct communication with customers to verify the balances they owe 
rather than performing an analysis of financial data. So letter C is correct. An analytical procedure would be comparing the gross profit margin of this company to industry averages. Reliability of data is important for analytical procedures. Reliability is affected by the source of the data and the conditions under which the data were gathered. For example, data are considered more reliable when obtained from independent sources outside of the entity. Data is also considered more reliable when obtained from sources inside the entity that are independent of those responsible for the amount being audited. Because data provided by a department that is responsible for the audited amount is more likely to be compromised in terms of reliability because there's a potential conflict of interest there and an inherent risk of bias or manipulation. So as an auditor performing analytical procedures, you want your data to be from independent sources outside of the entity, or if they have to come from inside the entity, you want that data from inside the entity to come from sources independent of those responsible for the amount being audited. Data is also considered more reliable when obtained from sources under strict internal control environments. A strict internal control environment generally enhances the reliability of data. Strong internal controls reduce the risk of error and fraud, leading to more trustworthy data for analytical procedures. And data is also considered more reliable when obtained from sources that are free from error. Data from a newly implemented accounting system, for example, should be approached with skepticism until its accuracy can be verified. New systems may have implementation errors or require adjustments before they operate correctly. Auditors should corroborate data from new systems with other evidence to ensure it's reliable. How about this? What is a crucial factor for the reliability of data used in analytical procedures? A, the complexity of the data, B, the source of the data, C, the quantity, D, the format. And if you think you know, leave me the answer in the comments section. And don't forget to like and subscribe because it really helps the channel out a lot. And if you need more help with audit or any part of the CPA exam, go to i75cpareview.com. You can apply for a scholarship. If you want to get started right away, click CPA Review, then Audit Course, or take advantage of one of our specials. But get yourself on I-75 with me, Darius Clark, because the right teacher makes all the difference.